Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another video. Thanks to some recently declassified documentation which was largely ignored by the Western media, we are going to be hearing some things, quite possibly, for the very first time. If you wish to check my citations and sources, please refer to the links in the description below. Also be sure to like and share this video, as all of that really does help. Without further delay, here we go. Something most of us are forced to learn about in the West is the Jewish Holocaust, especially information centred around the Nazi-built concentration camps. According to the Holocaust Memorial website, some of the worst atrocities in human history were committed there. Now isn't it ironic that only a few short years after the alleged Holocaust, post-World War II Zionist Jews would imprison tens of thousands of Palestinian civilians including women and children, within 22 Zionist-run concentration and labour camps that existed from 1948 to 1955. Not only that, but many of them were systematically murdered and tortured. You would think something like this would never be allowed to happen, especially since the inception of the United Nations, especially after World War II. And you would be wrong. This information is particularly important because for many years, largely due to cover-up, a lot of the information I'm about to share with you was considered to be nothing more than an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. Thanks to the declassification of Israeli war documents in 1999 that were largely ignored, and an in-depth investigation conducted by the Journal of Palestinian Studies, we now have a lot of information that proves the events that took place in the years between 1948 to 1955. It was really tough to find a starting point for this particular topic, and upon my unwillingness to discuss the entire history of Zionism for the sake of time, our story begins back in 1947, two years after the United Nations was officially created. The future of Palestine was being discussed by many nations, without any representative for Palestine even being present. With the establishment of the United Nations in 1945, the British pulled out of Palestine and handed control of the land to the United Nations, who decided to give the Zionists basically everything that they wanted. To quote Brett Wilkins on the topic, who wrote a story about the Lydia Death March back in 2018, quote, In late 1947, Britain, worn down by a ferocious Jewish terror campaign led by men who included future Israeli Prime Ministers Menachem Benin and Yitzhak Shamir, announced it would end its 30-year occupation of Palestine. The Palestine problem would now be for the fledging United Nations to solve, and, to that end, the world body devised a plan to partition the territory between Jews and Arabs. The latter, the Palestinians, were not consulted. Under the United Nations plans, Jews, who comprised just under a third of Palestine's population at the time, were given 55% of the land. Unquote. Of course, the decision made by the Zionists and the United Nations didn't sit well with the Palestinian natives and surrounding nations like Jordan and Syria. The proposal was welcomed by the migrant Jewish community, but rejected by the Arab leaders, and of course civil war broke out between the two communities. With the British in exodus of the region, much of the violence started to escalate. The total strength of the Israeli attackers was about 8,000 men. The only regular Arab troops defending Lydia and Ramallah was a minuscule force of 125 men. The 5th Infantry Company of the Transjordian Arab Legion. An exceedingly well-armed Jewish army, thanks to Soviet financing, was able to dominate the Palestinian forces, even taking away parts of land that was not reserved for them, but for the Palestinians. This included two regions of Lydia and Ramallah. Both towns were strategically important because they sat at the intersection of Palestine's main north and south and east and west roads, which basically divided their nation's main road control. Palestine's main railway junction and its airport, now known as Ben Gurion International Airport, were in Lydia, and the main source of Jerusalem's water supply was less than 15 kilometres away. These areas were of major strategic importance to the Palestinians, and this was one of the main reasons the Zionists sought to capture it illegally. 
In July 1948, after David Ben-Gurion illegally announced Israel's independence upon the departure of the British troops, Israeli troops forcefully compelled the entire population of almost 60,000 Palestinian civilians to flee from their homes in Lydia in the middle of the hot Mediterranean summer. After capturing Lydia from the east, they were to advance on Ramallah, attacking it from the north while making feints against it from the west. Lydia and Ramallah were bombed from the air. When many of the native inhabitants refused to leave, or couldn't, Israeli Prime Minister, at the time, David Ben-Gurion, gave the orders to ethnically cleanse both towns. The edicts to seize both cities and ethnically cleanse them were signed by Yitzhak Rabin, who would later become Israel's Prime Minister. Most of the expellees were women, children and elderly men, as most of the able-bodied men were taken into concentration and work camps. Yitzhak Rabin underlined the cruelty of the operation as mirrored in the reaction of the soldiers. He stated during an interview with David Shipler from the New York Times on October 22, 1979, that, quote, Great suffering was inflicted upon the men taking in the eviction action. They included youth movement graduates who had been inculcated with values such as international brotherhood and humaneness. The eviction action went beyond the concepts they were used to. There were some fellows who refused to take part. Prolonged propaganda activities were required after the action to help explain why we were obliged to undertake such a harsh and cruel action, unquote. This interview was also censored by Israeli publications soon after. The Ben-Gurion guidelines to the Israeli Defense Force had specified there were to be no robbery, but numerous sources spoke of widespread looting. The Economist wrote on the 21st of August that year, the Arab refugees were systematically stripped of all their belongings before they were sent on their trek to the frontier. Household belongings, stores, clothing, all had to be left behind. Unquote. Dov Shafri, who was appointed Israel's custodian of absentee property, who supposedly was charged to protect and redistribute the Palestinian property, but his staff were inexperienced and unable to control the situation which was allowed to get much, much worse. Pachor Shatrit, the Minister of Minority Affairs, said that the army removed 1,800 truckloads of property from Lydia alone, just to put in perspective how bad the looting really was. According to Palestinian historian Aref al Aref, who was in Lydia at the time of the expulsion, quote, the heat wasn't the only danger the refugees faced. Not content with stealing everything the fleeing Arabs left behind in their homes and businesses, Israeli soldiers had set up roadblocks and were searching and robbing refugees of their money, jewellery, and other precious family heirlooms. Unquote. There were also allegations that Israeli soldiers had raped Palestinian women. David Ben-Gurion referred to them in his diary entry for the 15th of July 1948, and also claimed, quote, the bitter question has arisen regarding acts of robbery and rape, rape of ones in conquered towns. Unquote. Israeli writer Amos Keenan, who served as a platoon commander of the 82nd Regiment of the Israeli Army Brigade that conquered Lydia, told the nation on the 6th of February 1989 that, quote, At night time, those of us who couldn't restrain ourselves would go into the prison compound to fuck Arab women. I want very much to assume, and perhaps even can, that those who couldn't restrain themselves did what they thought the Arabs would have done to them had they won the war." Unquote. On the 16th of July 1948, 
Aaron Sisling, the first Israeli agricultural minister, tried to caution the Israeli cabinet against this aggression. This quote from him came a few weeks after the ethnic cleansing of 70,000 people from Lydia and Ramallah. Quote, It's been said that there were cases of rape in Ramallah. I can forgive rape, but I will not forgive other acts which seem to be much worse. When they enter a town and forcibly remove rings from fingers and jewellery from someone's neck, that is a very grave matter. Many are guilty of it. Unquote. As a way to deal with the Palestinians who refused to leave, or who couldn't leave, many of them were forced into concentration camps with prisoners of war. The International Red Cross, who were active in Palestine at the time of the Civil War, details some of the atrocities that took place in reports. One such report claims, quote, The internment of thousands of Palestinian civilians in Israeli-run prisoners of war camps is a relatively little-known episode in the 1948 war. Aside from the day-to-day -day treatment of the internees, the International Red Cross reports focused on the legal and humanitarian implications of civilian internment and on Israel's resort to forced labour to support its war effort. Most of the 5,000 or so Palestinian civilians in four official camps were reduced to conditions described by one International Red Cross official as slavery, and then expelled them from the country at the end of the war. Unquote. As we can see, the, the conditions that a lot of these Palestinians were subject to, even outside of the imprisonments in concentration camps, were very extreme. Even before the establishment of Zionist-run concentration camps, captured civilians were put to work. Reporting on a visit to Acre on the 30th of May 1948, International Red Cross delegate Der Muron stated that the men, whether soldiers or not, were being employed under the orders of the Haganah for public work, drying of wetlands and military work. Visiting the same towns a few weeks later, he concluded that the primary reason for detaining the entire male population of villages or row houses occupied was the need for labour. Thanks to the International Red Cross, we have at least one account of a prison population, as you can see in this graph. Although this graph only concerns one month, the overwhelming preponderance of Palestinian prisoners was consistent throughout the war. Israeli documents and testimonies of former civilian internees suggest that the total number of prisoners of war and civilian internees may have been significantly greater than indicated by the International Red Cross reports. So it's quite possible that the stuff that we're talking about today, uh, that things are actually a lot worse than, than what's actually been revealed to us in a lot of this documentation. With thousands of Palestinians being forced into labour camps and to work for Israel's war efforts, around 400 known deaths took place, mostly due to dehydration and mistreatment. That's just the deaths we can account for. What isn't known is the total number of people that were murdered. What we do have, though, is an interesting quote by a man called Yeshua Gorodinchek, a member of the Israeli military force at the time, who admitted to at least one whole prison population being murdered. Quote, We had prisoners, and before the retreat we decided to liquidate them. We also liquidated the wounded. We eliminated every Arab we came across up to that point. Unquote. The hypocrisy of some post-World War II Zionist Jews who wanted to literally holocaust civilian Palestinians shouldn't go without being noticed. Unfortunately, today, denial dominates the conversation, and that's when there is any conversation at all about Israel's past and their present crimes. It's not something they like to admit to or even talk about. Not only the denial of the massacres that took place in Lydia and Ramallah, and the concentration camps that followed, but their overall history is something that we're just not really allowed to talk about in general. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to the channel guys and check out the playlists. Also, be sure to follow me on Twitter. And on that note folks, thanks for watching. God bless.